In this demonstration, we're going to be discussing spectrum imaging using EDS. So, a few things to consider in, when you're performing spectrum imaging, whether that's with EDS or with EELS, and unfortunately we don't have an EELS system, so I can't cover that. But if you're doing any type of spectrum imaging, um, you want to make sure you have a clean specimen. Uh, so if it's possible, you always want to plasma clean your sample ahead of time. You can also see here that we are using the double tilt holder, which is optimized to provide line of sight to the EDS detector. But that's not to say, of course, you can't do EDS with a single tilt holder. There's an adjustment that you have to make, though, uh, which we'll, we'll talk about here in a minute. So, I already have an HIADF stem image of the specimens. You can see these are, are particulate uh, specimens. They're actually what are known as core shell particles, which uh, will get a higher magnification image here. So, you can, you can see what I'm talking about when I say core shell. Um, but we already have the stem image up. We already have the, this instrument aligned in stem mode. As was discussed in the stem demo, you want to make sure when you're doing analytical work, you need a low numerical value of spot size. You need high current when you're doing an analytical work. Um, so you need a low spot size. The other thing you can do is you can use a larger C2 aperture. So as was discussed in the, the STEM demo, the number one aperture gives me an optimal semi-angle of convergence to get optimal probe size. So I actually have that set right now and I can still get reasonably high current by using that aperture um, without the expense of a larger probe. So I'm just leaving it there set at one. Um, I could boost it to two if I wanted to and I would of course get an increase in current as a result of that but at the expense of potentially a larger probe. Um, there's always trade-offs and, and and uh, benefits whenever you want more current. So obviously lower numerical spot size gives you higher current, also gives you a bigger probe. If you, use an op if you use an optimally sized C2 aperture, that's usually going to cut your current down a little bit. If you go bigger than that though, that'll give you more current, but again at the expense of a larger probe. So we're just gonna leave it set right there for now. Okay, so we have the, the double tilt holder in, so we don't have to make any uh, adjustments to the stage tilt as a result of using, using the holder. We're at zero degrees tilt right now, and as we're going to see here, because these are core shell particles, we do want the particles to be oriented a certain way to get an accurate spectrum image. Um, if we were using the single tilt holder, okay, so, and this was discussed in the EDS demo, come to the stage tab, and then you'd have to set the alpha tilt to 15 degrees. That's again to give clear line of sight to your EDS detector, okay? We're not going to do that because we don't need to. We have the double tilt holder in. Um, that, of course, really with something like this, where we have this core shell arrangement, um, having the, the holder untilted actually becomes a necessity to get the spectrum imaging that we want. So this is my live hat of stem image. So I need to come down here to RTEM control, insert my detector, hear the sound, that's the detector going in. Okay, so now you can see we have some particles that are kind of isolated. So if we look here, like this one's this one's isolated, this one's isolated. Um, there's a few ones over here that are isolated. You always want to try to find one that's isolated. That's not always easy to do depending on how much the particles cluster. But let's take a look at this one right here. So I'm going to use the stage here, move that to the middle. Okay, increase my magnification and hopefully we'll be able to see here this core shell structure. Right. 
so turn my focus step down a bit. So hopefully you can see that there's actually around the edge of the particle I'll switch to preview mode here so it'll be a little easier to see okay so around the edge of this particle you can see there's a there's a well-defined shell so that shell has different composition and so that actually makes this um, a good specimen to use for mapping purposes so I singled out this particle for two reasons. One is that it's isolated from this cluster, okay, meaning it's not touching any other particles. But more importantly is it's sitting flat. So I can clearly see these edges here on the sample. So if I was to look instead at, say, this guy right here, clearly it's not sitting flat. So if I wanted to see the core shell structure, that's going to be hard to do if I wanted to map this particle. Okay, so you need a particle that's sitting flat like this. These are these are square, so they tend to sit um, they tend to sit flat in a, in a manner like that. Obviously, if you have spherical particles, this becomes pretty much irrelevant because you have an infinite number of uh, symmetry operations. But in this case, we have square particles, and we need them to be uh, sitting flat in order to get um, good spectrum imaging. If you were working, for example, with a film on a substrate, you would need to orient the specimen in such a way that your interface between the film and the substrate was parallel to the beam direction. Okay, so this is very much analogous to that where we have this interface between the shell and the core and our beam is basically traveling directly along that interface. So that's what you need to get an optimal spectrum image. So I made a slight adjustment to the detector contrast brightness, so I think it's probably a little bit easier to see that shell here around the core. So the types of spectrum imaging you can do really falls into what's one-dimensional and what's two-dimensional. So a one-dimensional um, spectrum image is usually called a line scan or a profile, and a two-dimensional is called a map. We'll, we'll cover both of those here. Um, if you have uh, particles like this, or really just an interface, it's usually best to get an orientation where your interface of interest is vertical, and then you're mapping left to right. So what we're going to do here is adjust the rotation of the image so that the sides of the square are vertical and horizontal. Okay, so I'm going to come back over here, okay, click on rotation. Okay, so negative is a clockwise rotation, so I actually want to go positive here. That should Let's see here. Okay, yeah, so that's Still adjusting here. Okay, so we're pretty close here. I'm gonna move it a little bit more just to get it as perfect as we can get it. All right, so that looks pretty good right there. So we've got the particle aligned. Obviously, you want to make sure you've got, you know, your image focused and stigmated if necessary. We have it set pretty well right here. Um, so if we want to do just a line scan across this particle, um, I'm going to actually decrease my magnification a little bit here. Okay, and we'll we'll leave it like that. Um, you want to make sure when you're doing this, because we're going to use drift correction, you need to make sure there's an area in the specimen that can be used as a reference. So we've got lots of area in here that's very unique and easily identifiable. 
um, so we can use that as a reference for drift correction. So now what I have to do is go to the EDS tab, okay, and I have the stem panel in here. I need to acquire an image. Okay, you have to do this every time before you do any type of spectrum image. All right, so image has been acquired. So I can come over here, set my dispersion. Again, I'm just gonna use 5 EB and 12.8 microseconds. That, that, that usually works fine, just as a default. Now here in experiments, select spectrum collection, and then drift corrected spectrum profile. This pulls up two features here. One is a box. This box is used as the drift correction reference. You want to put this somewhere that you're not going to be doing the line scan. So I'm going to put it right there. And then this is your actual line scan. Okay, so if we want to map across this particle, we obviously don't need it to be this long. So I can just grab the end here and just pull this across. And it's actually telling me how long the line is. So it's about 285 nanometers. Okay, um, I do like to leave a little extra space on the left because I have noticed empirically there tends to be a shift in the maps um, towards the left from where you actually tell them to do the map. So if we come back over to experiments, this is where we input the parameters for the map. So now the profile size is the number of points in the line. Okay, so Let's just say for the sake of argument, the line is 250, point, or 250 nanometers long. So profile size of 250 would mean one nanometer steps. Okay, so if I had 500 nanometers, that would be half a nanometer steps. So my probe size is about a nanometer. So realistically, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to go less than half a nanometer. Okay, I can never get better resolution than my probe size. The reason half a nanometer is a limit to really what I should do for the step size is that the Nyquist-Shannon sampling theorem says that the spatial resolution in a digital image will be twice the pixel size. So in this case, it will be twice, for a line scan, twice the step size, okay? So again, if I have a 250 nanometer long line, I have 500, points in the line, that's half a nanometer per point, which means my spatial resolution will be about a nanometer, okay? So we'll leave it like that for now. Um, again, the line is actually about, I think it's 285, so that should give us close to a nanometer resolution. The dwell time is how long you're getting signal at each point. So usually for a line scan, Half a second to a second uh, usually works well. Obviously, the longer you go, the, the better the signal you're going to get. Um, it, will, it will make the map take longer. We're going to change this here, though. Okay, we'll, just, we'll change it to 500 here, just for the sake of doing this quicker. Okay, the only other thing you have to adjust now are the correction settings. Okay, so this is where we tell the system uh, how we want it to perform the drift correction. Okay, so the main parameter here that's important is acquisitions in a slice. So that's a fancy way of saying how many points in the profile will be acquired before a drift correction is applied. So if I'm doing 50 here, I'm going to take 50 points in the line and then the system's going to drift correct. Okay, so if I'm going half a second for each point, that means 25 seconds per correction. So the more frequently you do a correction, the better the correction works. You don't want to take too long between corrections. You also don't want to be too short either because again, that takes a lot of time. We're not doing a super high resolution map here. So 50 should be reasonable um, for what we want to do at the scale we're working at. And you also notice hopefully the, sta the sample is quite stable not really moving around a lot. Okay, so we'll leave it at 50, and that'll give us a correction every 25 seconds. Okay, and then at this point, we're ready to start the map. Um, I did spend a while setting this up and explaining everything. In practice, you don't wanna wait that long. You wanna draw your box, draw your line, position your box, set these up, and you wanna go. Okay, because the sample isn't stagnant, it is moving. 
So you run the risk potentially of starting your analysis and then your particle is no longer under the line. Okay, so you want to be a little bit quicker than this. Obviously, in we're doing this for demonstration purposes, so not really a big deal. And then I'm going to select acquire. Okay, so this is the reference image. Okay, so that's where we told it to do the drift correction. So what it's doing now here is this green cursor in the image is the probe position. Okay, and this is the EDX spectrum that's being acquired at that position. So in these other windows here, okay, so you see down here, so now it did a drift correction. Okay, it took a reference image from this area and now it figured out how much did the sample move. Okay, so that's what it's doing here. That's what it's using this window for right here. This is the detector signal that's being acquired as the probe is scanning. Okay, so we're not really seeing anything right now because we haven't really gotten to the particle yet. Okay, but actually we're, we're getting there now. So you can actually see, I'm starting to see some signal in my detector here and as well in the EDS. Okay, so this will take a few minutes to do. It's not uncommon for a high quality line scan to take maybe, you know, five, six minutes, at least on this system, which is an older system. So I'm going to go ahead and stop this and we will resume once the scan is complete. So the spectrum profile is complete. Uh, once it's complete, those windows related to the, or actually they're called panes, related to the drift correction will go away. And what you'll be left with are the original stem image with the line scan and drift correction areas, the stem detector signal versus position, and an EDS uh, spectrum window. So you notice this vertical line here in the stem signal window. If I drag this, you can see down here, okay, you can see how the spectrum changes, right, as I move across here. Okay, so you're seeing again, right, you're seeing the spectrum at each individual point in the line here. So that's one thing you can extract from this if you wanted to know this at any pixel. Um, but to actually generate the, the profiles, which is what we're interested in, we need to first save, um, save the display as an EMI. Come down here to the Save button. Okay, I'll go ahead here, find my folder. Okay, and we'll save it. And now we have to switch to analysis mode. So when you're acquiring, that's acquire mode. And then when you want to actually generate the maps, we have to go into analysis mode. So I'm going to select that little blue rectangle here. Okay. And now what's really useful to do, if you if you already know the elements and you know what peaks you want to map, okay, meaning K alpha or L alpha, so on and so forth, you can go ahead and do that. But what's really useful to do is to generate a sum spectrum. So a sum spectrum is literally the spectrum generated by adding up the individual spectra at each point in the line. So if I want to do that, it's easy to do. Come down here, you find your square tool, come up to your stem image, and then you draw that box around the line. Okay, come up here to components, go down to sum spectra and select integrate, and then you will see a sum spectrum. So the advantage of this is that you see these really well-defined peaks and it becomes a lot easier to see the individual signals that you're trying to map. Um, I can click on this and expand it. Okay, and now if I wanna know what peaks are what, I can perform an auto ID. Okay, come up here, this is an auto ID. Oops, and you have to actually click, click on the dark blue part then do that, okay? If this window comes up here, you can just close it. All right, so there's my individual peaks. If I wanna sub-label them by transition, which is a useful thing to do, come back up here, and then select this eye with the left-right arrows, okay? And then I see what I'm interested in. So the elements that I'm interested in 
um, and this specific sample are chromium, iron, and cobalt. Okay, so, um, and another one would be, and the other one would be rubidium. Okay, so I can see all of these here. All right, so I've got K peaks for all of those. Um, you can see the chromium K alpha is well isolated from everything. The iron K alpha is also well isolated. There's a little bit of an issue here in that the chromium, sorry, the cobalt K alpha overlaps a little bit with the iron K beta. Um, that is a minor effect though because the beta peak is always much weaker than the alpha peak. So that shouldn't be too much of a problem. So we can map chromium, iron, and cobalt using the K-alpha. And then down here, we see rubidium, K-alpha, and we can map that as well. Um, there are some other elements down here, or some other peaks down here that we're not really interested. Obviously, we have carbon from the, from the support film, and we have a bunch of L-peaks. Part of the problem with these L-peaks, though, is that they overlap um, very, um, very severely. So it's always better usually to use K peaks uh, if they're well separated. So that's what we're going to do. Although of course there may be exceptions to that depending on the scenario. So I'm going to come up here, click on this periodic table, come down here to ROI, and I'll start here. So we'll start with chromium. I double click it, make it blue, and then I have to come up here and select which peaks. Okay, so I'm going to deselect L and M and only use K. So this by default goes to just K alpha, even though it just says K, it only maps the alpha peak. And then what else do we have? We have iron, we'll do the same thing. We have cobalt, we'll do the same thing. And then the last one is rubidium, and we'll do the same thing. Okay, so we've defined now what elements and what peaks we want to map. Close this. Click on the blue part of the spectrum. Come up to components, auto map, and then generate output. Okay, and you can see here, okay, we'll close this window. So I can see here now, these are my line scans. Okay, so I've got four uh, elements of interest here, but what I can see actually, um, and I can expand this again, okay, so I can see this increase here, so the red is chromium, okay, so I can see here this increase in the chromium signal at the edge of the particle, right, where the shell is, okay, so the shell is chromium rich, which I knew ahead of time, but again, now we have an analytical uh, proof of this, right, because we've generated the, um, the line scan or the spectrum profile, okay, so I can again, I can auto scale this. Um, if you want to save this data, you can save it a few ways, so if I right click and then I do um, export, that will just save as this image, okay, I, I can save this as a bitmap or a TIFF. I'm not going to do it, but that's how you can save it. If you want to save the raw data, though, which is what people usually want to do, then they can put it into another um, another software program. You have to click on, I'll expand this here, you have to click on the individual lines. So let's click on the orange one here. Okay, that's the iron K, right click, and then export. And now I can save that as a text document. And that will have counts versus position that can then be replotted in some sort of graphical um, analysis software like Kaleidograph or MATLAB if you want to generate your own uh, plots, okay? Which we're not going to do, but that's how you would do it, okay? Uh, it's very important to keep in mind when you're doing this that you do not, under any circumstances, delete this panel right here, okay? This one um, that is the spectrum at the pixel of interest as specified here in the image or the the stem detector okay if you delete this panel okay you can delete it by right clicking delete i'm not going to do it okay but if you do that 
then you will not be able to generate any of these maps or line scans, okay? So the uh, effort you will have put in will end up being uh, essentially fruitless, okay? So um, if you wanted to delete the sum spectrum, that's fine. You can delete the maps, those can be recovered. Um, but this, if this is deleted, effectively makes the panel worthless, okay? So don't do that. And we'll go ahead and we'll auto scale that back to the default. And that is how to perform a line scan or a spectrum profile. So let's go ahead and save the EMI file. Okay, and then we can go ahead and, and close it. Just hit the little X button here. Go back to acquire mode. Okay, and we can get rid of this panel because we have this image on the EMI file we just saved. Okay, and we can close that too. All right, so when you're done doing a profile, uh, at least the way we have this set up, it blanks off the beam when it's done, so we have to unblank, and then we have to search. All right, so you'll notice here, this is the particle we were working on. Okay, so you'll notice, if we look here closely, I'll mag in a little bit, okay, you can see And you can see the line here from where we scanned across, okay? That's very common. Um, most likely that is carbon contamination buildup, okay? So again, you can plasma clean the samples. You may avoid that, you may not. Um, some samples are more prone to that than others. This is a fairly old specimen and it is on a support film, so the amount of cleaning that can be done to it is minimal. This could potentially also be uh, some form of beam damage if the specimen is beam sensitive. I'm actually not so sure on this specific sample. But anyways, if you're seeing this in your line scan when you're done, okay, that's what's happening. You're either getting some sort of contamination buildup, most likely, or you're getting some kind of beam damage. So if we wanna do a map, let's go ahead and find another particle that we haven't um, already adulterated here. So we'll go ahead and mag out. Okay, so we got a few options here. This looks like a good one. All right, so yeah, that looks good. Zero out my rotation here. All right, so it looks like I need to do a negative okay, or clockwise rotation. Go into preview mode here. Pretty close there. Make a oops. Take a look here, almost, I think. All right, that looks pretty good. Um, we didn't move very far, so we should be fine in terms of sample still being at eucentric height. Um, I didn't state it earlier explicitly, but yes, you need to be at eucentric height when you're doing this. You can obviously set that, should set that, when you're still in TEM mode. We'll go ahead here. We'll just check the focus here. I'll go back to search mode. Yeah, focus was already pretty good, but just a All right, right there. And then I'll go further down in mag to maybe there. So one thing that should be kept in mind here, I'll move this a little bit off center, is that in an EDS or a spectrum image, okay, EDS, EELS, whatever, your resolution is dictated by 
the parameters you give for the line or the box, okay, if we're doing a map. So it's not governed by the magnification that you're using, okay, and in some instances using too high of a magnification can be a little bit counterproductive, okay. So in other words, I can draw a box that's 100 pixels by 100 pixels that's 100 nanometers by 100 nanometers wide, okay, and I could do that at two different magnifications and my map resolution will be exactly the same, okay, because again, my box dimensions are the same irrespective of the magnification. The displayed side will, size will be different, but ultimately that won't influence the resolution I get um, in the map, okay. So we'll leave this here. Uh, for now, again, it is you, you want something, some area that can be used as a reference for drift correction, something that's recognizable. We have a lot of stuff like that here, so this works good. Okay, so come over here to, now, now in the EDS tab. Okay, and again, I need to do an acquire. Okay, for the stem image, so I select acquire. So over here in experiments, select spectrum collection, and now drift corrected spectrum image. So again, I got two boxes. One is my drift correction reference. I'm gonna put that right here. And then two is my actual area. I want a spectrum image. So I can make this whatever size I want. I wanna just map this particle. Um, Again, I'm going to leave a little bit of cushion on the left here because I know the map tends to kind of shift that way. Okay, and now, again, I check the parameters here. So for a high quality map, um, I would usually use something that's 100 by 100. The way this is set up right now is that the X pixels are fixed and then the Y adjusts accordingly based on the aspect ratio of the box. So in other words, if I drew a perfect square, it'd be 100 by 100. If I drew something that was like a two to one aspect ratio, it would automatically adjust the Y to be 200. Um, the dwell time I found empirically, you don't wanna use less than 200 milliseconds or you end up with an EDS map that looks, for lack of a better term, disjointed or segmented, but incorrect otherwise. So just to, so now that we, if we have 100 by 100 roughly here, so this looks like my box is about, it's a little bit bigger probably than 200 nanometers, so therefore my step size is two nanometers roughly, okay, which means my map resolution will be about four nanometers which should be sufficient for what we need to do. Obviously, you can make this as big or as small as you want. The bigger you make it, the better your resolution will be. Again, up to a point, there's really no benefit in, in this particular microscope. You don't wanna step less than half a nanometer because there's really no benefit to doing that. Um, obviously, you're talking about a tremendous number of points now, so do the math. If it's 100 by 100, that's now um, 10,000 pixels that have to be mapped, whereas with the line scan, that was a matter of you know 500 pixels. So doing a map is a more time-intensive process. Okay, number of acquisitions in slice. So again, if I have a 200 millisecond dwell time, then it's going to do 100 points, which is basically one scan from left to right and then do a drift correction, and that's about 20 seconds. That should be sufficient for what we need to do because the sample's stable. Again, about, uh, about 20 seconds, 15 seconds per correction is usually sufficient. Um, it's usually a good idea, too, to set the correction to occur, if you can, at the end of a scan um, because if you set it to correct in the middle, sometimes that gives you a map that looks a little bit segmented because of the way that the system accommodates for the drift, okay? 
So we have this all set up, everything looks good here. We'll go ahead and select acquire. Okay, so it did its reference image, and now you can see here that green position is the pro position, and that's the spectrum being collected there. Okay, so it's going to get to the end, it does a drift correction, okay, and then it moves down to the next Y pixel and does the same thing. Okay, so this is a serial process. It's not uncommon for a high quality map, again this is an older system, newer systems are much faster, for a high quality map to be 30-40 minutes to do. Um, again this is for something that's roughly 100 by 100 with 20, sorry 200 millisecond dwell time. So any change in any of those parameters obviously will adjust your map time accordingly. Okay, So I'm going to go ahead and stop the video here and we will um, resume this once the map is done and we will discuss how to actually generate the individual um, element maps which is actually very similar to what we did for the line scans. So an update here, we're about midway through the map. Um, you can see this is the stem detector signal. Um, so you can see the image of the particle here. It is shifted over to the left from where we told it to do the map. I knew that was going to happen to a degree. That probably happened a little more severely than I anticipated because, again, we took a little long between when we started the map um, and when I did the image acquisition. Again, you want to keep that time minimal. It looks like we'll get the whole particle in here though, we're not going to get cut off. We have enough um, open space here on the side. Okay, But you can see now, right, as this... So I don't have a lot of counts. This would be deceptive at first, but I can actually get a map from this, and we will uh, once this is done. And so we'll pick this back up again once this is completed. So the spectrum image is complete. Once again, the drift correction windows go away um, and we're left with now this image of the detector signal. Again, I move this pixel or this pointer around, I can see the individual um, spectrum at that point. So right here in the middle, we're actually seeing um, some signal. If I go off here, um, I'm not really seeing anything. I'm just seeing really just a, a, a background from the carbon. Um, you will notice that the this is shifted over relative to where we did the the box, which is something I've noticed. It happens empirically, but this is also probably worse than it would have been if we had initiated the map sooner. But we got it in there, so that's good. So we'll go ahead have to save the EMI file. All right, and then switch to analysis mode. Okay, and then same thing, let's generate some spectrum. So now we just have to click on this box. We don't have to draw another box. Some spectrum, integrate. Okay. And so again, don't delete this middle pane here, but we can just move this up. And it's the same um, composition that we had before. We know what we're looking for, but again, we can, can do an auto ID. Uh, actually, I have to click on this first. Do an auto ID. Okay, I can get rid of that. I can do a transition ID. Okay, so we'll map the same things that we mapped before, just the, the K lines for the chromium, the iron, the cobalt, and the rubidium. Okay, so again, we'll come back up here to the periodic table. Okay, and we need to now, again, reselect our elements and ROIs. Chromium, select K, 
iron do the same thing that's already selected cobalt's already selected and then rubidium is also selected okay so click on the blue part of the spectrum okay if, if you don't do that let's I'll show you what happens okay so I'm not I didn't click on the dark blue part if I try to generate the maps now I get an error okay so I don't know this is a glitch in TIA or something you just have to click on that dark blue part and now if you generate maps auto map generate output okay so I'm gonna go ahead I'll expand this so we can see it here All right so let me collapse this down a little bit alright so there's our I can make these a little bit bigger it'll be a little easier to see okay but if you recall from the line scan we knew that the shell was chromium rich Okay, so we actually see the same thing here. So we got chromium K, iron K, cobalt K, and rubidium K. Those again refer to the alpha peaks. But we can see exactly what we uh, saw essentially in the uh, line scan data. Okay, so now one of the unfortunate drawbacks of TIA is that it will not make a composite um, spectrum image. Okay, so a composite image would be where all of these maps are overlaid, and so you see the individual colors um, spatially oriented with respect to each other. Okay, so we uh, can't do that in TIA, but that can be done um, easily using ImageJ, and so that's what we'll go over how to do next. So generating the composite spectrum image, um, first thing we have to do is, is assign colors to the maps. Your first three colors should always be red, green, blue um, in order of importance. So we've got chromium's already red. I'm gonna change the iron here to blue. If you wanna change this to blue, right click, go down to properties, and then style here in this image tab you find blue, okay, apply, then okay, whoops, it didn't turn blue, let me do this again, no, you don't want normal, normal is grayscale, blue, alright, there we go, alright, so we want that blue, um, let's change the cobalt to green, okay, those are my three important ones, iron, uh, chromium, iron, and cobalt, okay, so let's change this to green, And green, apply, close, and then we have rubidium. So what you do after red, green, blue is kind of a matter of personal preference. Um, we don't want to use green again because we already have that defined for cobalt. So why don't we go ahead here, we've got orange, purple. Um, we can use, is there a yellow? Yeah, let's go ahead, we'll use yellow here. Okay, so now we need to individually save um, the, the spectrum images. So if I right click on Chromium K, export data. Okay, and you wanna export this as PC TIFF with scale marker. So I'll go ahead and select save. And I'll do this for all of these as well. And I do the same thing for the iron K the same thing for cobalt K and do the same thing for rubidium K. So now I have those exported. Now I need to open up image J. I've got image J on here already. Okay, here it is. And now I need to open up those individual maps. Okay, so Find my folder here. All right, so where are we? All right, so I need to find the, in, there's the chromium. Okay, I need to do this for all the maps. Unfortunately, I can't open them all up at the same time. Let's see here. 
There's the rubidium. And the last one is the iron. All right, so I've got all four of my maps. And so generating the composite now is very easy to do. So I come here to image J, go to image, go to color, go to merge channels. Okay, so the red channel, we wanna be the map we designated as red, which is of course chromium. Um, the green, let's designate what well, we designated that as the cobalt. Okay, the iron we designated as blue. And then the yellow we designated as rubidium. Okay, so all we have to do now, check create composite, select OK. And there you get a composite now spectrum image. So you can see now the spatial distribution of each of those elements with respect um, to one another. And it's rather striking, really, um, in comparison to just seeing the individual maps, which by themselves, of course, are useful. But this is really probably the most uh, beneficial way to display a spectrum image is with all of the maps uh, overlaid on top of each other in a composite. So to save this, um, it depends on what version of operating system you have. This is XP. It doesn't like high bit. Uh, files. So what we have to do with this usually is adjust this to just RGB color and then you can save as a TIFF. Okay, so you can save it as composite. I think I already have one named composite. I'll just put an extension there. But then it's saved. Okay. Uh, so these individual maps, we already, we already talked about how to save those. You right click and then export. You can save those as TIFFs. Okay. All right, so I'll go ahead and save this, the panel, so we have that done. We'll switch back out. Okay, I'll go ahead and close that. Okay, and so that is how to perform spectrum imaging with EDS. Uh, doing that with EELS is, in essence, no different. You're just using an EELS system, and you're, you're mapping... Uh, transition similarly to how we're mapping x-rays here. We don't have an EEL system on here, unfortunately. If you have any questions about this, uh, please feel free to let me know. Thank you.